This next video is about the Gilded Age and the big wigs, uh, the big monopolists who come to become fabulously wealthy uh, during this time period. The game Monopoly, if you think about the game Monopoly, if you've ever played it, it's really about this time period. It's a product of it where these people are trying, think about the game of Monopoly, you're trying to control the whole board and make it so that you control a whole property, a whole color, and that gives you therefore an opportunity to charge outrageous rates of rent and those kinds of things on those properties. So that's really what these monopolists are doing in this time period and where the game Monopoly came from. Um, where people like Andrew Carnegie and J.P. Morgan and John D. Rockefeller are going to learn how to consolidate and gain monopolies that will gain them wealth and control over an entire industry. Okay, so um, let's look here at what you're going to be learning. You're going to be figuring out who the major business leaders were of the Gilded Age and what some of their business strategies were. You're also going to see how they're considered differently by different interest groups, whether they are heroic or villainous in their, uh, their behaviors. So, this is uh, that reference to the monopoly that I was talking about in terms of the strategy to win at monopoly is to gain control of a whole um, industry or a whole area of the board. And that was the goal of these people as well. The first major uh, Gilded Age monopolist was uh, Andrew Carnegie, and he came to control U.S. Steel. Quite an ins inspiring rags to riches story himself, where he was uh, first an, a Scottish immigrant, grew up in the telegraph office, and then worked his way up. Um, he was the first one who came up with this idea of quality control, which is the idea that he wanted his product, which of course was steel, to be of consistent quality and always reliable. Um, this is kind of like um, an important, all of these are important concepts even in business today. If you think, for example, McDonald's versus, let's say you're traveling across the country and you go through, I don't know, Kansas or somewhere, and you need to stop for a hamburger, right? Well, you can stop at Big Mama's Burger Kitchen or you can stop at McDonald's. Well. Big Bertha's Burger Kitchen is an unknown quantity, right? Her burgers might be great, they might be terrible. You don't know, you've never had one. Now, McDonald's burgers may not be the best burger you ever had in your life, but they're consistent. You know exactly what you're going to get no matter where you have a McDonald's cheeseburger. It's always essentially the exact same product. And Andrew Carnegie tapped into that and realized that that's a very important aspect of a successful business to have consistent quality. So that was one idea that he came up with that uh, came to make him wealthy. A second idea is he started doing what's called cost control or accounting. He hired accountants who started to assess every cost um, of his production and calculate it to, um, to the penny. So he started to find out how much his materials were costing him, how much his labor was costing him, how much transportation was costing him. And then once he had a handle on that, he could start tweaking those costs trying to get them lower and lower so his price could stay the same for his product, but he could be making ever wider profit margins because um, he was actually cutting his costs. Um, so he's really the first one who harnessed the power of the accountant to make your business profitable. The third thing he did is he figured out that he needed to make his managers have an incentive to see things from his point of view and not the worker's point of view. So let's talk a little bit about that. It's still important today. Um, if you own a business, Okay, my, uh, my dad was uh, a small businessman for a period of time. If you own a business, you want things to run a certain way because you want the business in the end to be profitable. So let's say that you own a McDonald's. Okay, If you're the owner of the McDonald's, you want everyone to do everything perfectly. You want everybody to wear their head covered because they're supposed to according to OSHA regulations and you want the floor swept and you want everyone on point doing what it is they're supposed to do so that the dining experience is consistent for the customer, always high quality, it's a top run, uh, establishment. Well, the, also the goal of being an, an owner is to not have to be at your business all the time. You would like to be able to go play golf every once in a while and still be making money at your business. The problem is when you leave your business in charge, uh, a manager in charge of your business, unless you figure out a way to pay the manager in such a way that um, your interests are his interests, he has an incentive to identify more with the workers. Okay, He hangs out with the workers all the time, he wants to be friends with the workers, and so they tend, the workers tend to make, want him to be cool. Like, do we really have to cover our heads? Can we have a longer break than usual? Do we really have to sweep up the f store and clean the bathrooms at certain in intervals? Those kinds of things. And so it's really easy for your manager to kind of be the nice guy with the workers and therefore the quality of your product and the customer service you offer kind of decline. Andrew Carnegie figured this out. And what he realized is instead of paying his managers by the hour or putting them on salary, 
so that they just had to show up and it didn't really matter what they did um, in those hours. They just, you know, had to put in the FaceTime. He gave them stock incentives. So if the company made more money, they made more money. And suddenly the managers had the same mindset as the owners, which was, yeah, we are going to be crack down on our workers and make them as productive as possible because that's what's going to make the business successful and that's going to make me get higher pay. So that's the, that's the goal of these stock incentives that Andrew Carnegie came up with, is to make his managers think like owners and not think like workers. Um, and that would make them more willing to crack down on the workers and make them really work hard and meet uh, high standards and, and, and you know basically be the, the, the mean manager that the owners wanted him to be. Okay? So um, that's an important uh, contribution that Andrew Carnegie made to uh, uh, business management as well. He also figured out that he needed to cut his costs, and one way to do that was to buy out your suppliers. So even though he made steel, he started buying up iron ore uh, mines, and he started buying up railroads and uh, coal companies, and that, therefore, he could cut his costs, and then he could pass those savings on to his consumers by lowering the, co the cost of his steel. So vertical integration was also a key part. You buy out your suppliers. So if McDonald's was going to vertically integrate, what would they buy? Would they buy out Hardee's and Taco Bell and Arby's? Or would they buy out a beef company, a ketchup company, a soda company, and a paper products company? Which one would they do? I hope you're thinking, I feel like I'm Dora all of a sudden when she pauses to like listen to the kids say something. I hope you're thinking beef, ketchup, paper company, uh, french fry, a potato farm, because that, that would be vertically integrating if you were McDonald's, buying out your suppliers. Okay? All right. Next we have uh, Carnegie Hall. This is an important thing about Carnegie that um, I need to mention. Carnegie Hall is a famous performance area for performers and he built it as kind of a, a means of charity, but more important than Carnegie Hall is the other means by which Andrew Carnegie was charitable. We're going to be talking about this class. He had an, an important philosophy um, in which he called it the gospel of wealth. He said and admitted that there's a problem with capitalism. And that is that capitalism tends to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. Um, and that we have to do something about this problem with capitalism or capitalism will not survive because it, um, it can't continue down that. Or there's going to be a revolution, basically, if the poor get so desperate and the rich get so rich. His solution for this was not um, regulating capitalism. Um, and putting limits or regulations on the capitalists. His solution was that the capitalists who gain all this wealth should give their money away before they die. They should not pass it on to their children. It'll just make their children lazy. And um, Instead, they should force wealthy people to give all their money away before they die. And that's what Carnegie did. He built Carnegie Hall, but his biggest contribution was to things like public libraries um, and educational efforts for uh, people who wanted to kind of get ahead in life but needed a little boost. And um, he's also the big proponent of the estate tax, or what Republicans call the death tax. The idea that if anybody dies wealthy in this country, their wealth should all be taxed away and given to the government to redistribute uh, to create opportunities for poor. So uh, that was a key idea of, of Carnegie's as well. And one that he was the face for, but that a lot of um, entrepreneurs followed through on. Uh, John D. Rockefeller was actually more generous than even Carnegie. And it's also an attitude that we see reflected in modern entrepreneurs, um, like uh, the founder of Facebook, and um, Mark Zuckerberg and other um, uh, Bill Gates and other um, up-and-coming entrepreneurs in America that have made this commitment to give away a significant amount of their wealth. And that's all uh, kind of walking in the shoes of Andrew Carnegie and his gospel of wealth idea. Okay? So they weren't all uh, greedy, capitalist, uh, uh, selfish people during that time period, and, and Carnegie was a big advocate that they not follow that model but instead be generous. Um, here are just some examples of um, pictures from the time period. I think this example is really interesting. It shows a dinner party during the, the Gilded Age, and you can see the table is just unbelievably sumptuous. It's laid with all kinds of centerpieces um, shaped kind of like an upside-down champagne glass. And inside, like, the centerpiece is a palm tree, for heaven's sakes, and uh, you see all men dressed in uh, suits uh, all around this table. So you can just see kind of visually how the Gilded Age was one of fabulous wealth and... Um, yeah, just really sumptuous existence. There's no income tax during this time period, so wealthy people got to keep all of their wealth, and they were wealthy uh, beyond any standards of, of people who are wealthy today because of that. Next we have J.P. Morgan. Um, he gained wealth through railroads and eventually will buy out um, Andrew Carnegie by buying out U.S. Steel. He had an interesting practice called a holding company, 
what a holding company does is it is formed and it doesn't actually make anything instead it buys up other companies um, and usually tries to diversify those companies so that if one company isn't doing well the other one makes money this is how one of our most famous contemporaries uh, Warren Buffett I think he's the second richest man in America how he gained all of his wealth um, you don't probably you might have heard of Warren Buffett because um, he's been arguing here lately that uh, the wealthy should pay higher taxes surprisingly enough but um he uh, he gained wealth through creating a holding company called Berkshire Hathaway. So you probably never heard of Berkshire Hathaway because Berkshire Hathaway doesn't make anything. Instead, Berkshire Hathaway is a holding company, so it just bought up other companies. For example, he bought up Geico, remember the little gecko, um, Benjamin Moore Paints, um, Acme Building Products, um, Russell Athletic Wear, Fruit of the Loom. Um, so you can see that what he's done is he's bought up lots of companies in, in different industries and gained a lot of wealth through the diversification of those holdings. So uh, that's a classic holding company and um, can make people really wealthy. The person who's forming the holding company though has to have enough clout that people are willing to hand them over their money um, and trust in their investments uh, and kind of wisdom in their investments. So um, that's how a holding company works. Made JP Morgan very wealthy, makes Warren Buffett very wealthy today. Then we have uh, George Pullman uh, George Pullman makes railroad cars and uh, luxury cars for uh, the railroads, mainly sleeper cars and dining cars that are used on trains. He has an interesting uh, practice that allows him to become very wealthy. It's called the company town. The company town uh, is where the company owns the land, the houses, the churches, and schools around a factory. Um, and uh, I actually have a little bit of insight on the company town because... Um, my dad's side of the family, they grew up in a company town, and so I was able to talk to different members of my family about this. My grandparents came down out of the mountains of North Carolina and worked in textile mills around Charlotte um, for most of their adult lives. And the first place they moved into was a company town, and it's real interesting. If you ask my grandmother about life in a company town, she would talk about how convenient it was that they moved down here out of the mountains, her and my grandfather, and they didn't really have a lot of knowledge of city living and urban life and that the company town offered them a lot of things, just kind of one-stop shopping, right? You could get your house, there was a church, there was a school, there was a store, um, all of it right there on the company property. There was a, a bell that would ring you in and out of work. And she would talk about how it was just real nice and real convenient for them all to live there on the company town. Now, my dad, if you ask him about living in the company town, he has a very different kind of opinion about it, which was that they exerted an incredible amount of control over uh, my grandparents and um, not necessarily to didn't have the, the workers best interests at heart in fact I remember asking my grandmother about if my grandfather ever got hurt on the job for example and she said yes he did and and oftentimes you would find that um, like their medical treatment would be drawn out of their pay so you'd go to the doctor and he would charge you something and it would be deducted from your pay and then your tithing to the church would be deducted out of your pay and your children's textbooks at school would be deducted out of your pay and um, sanitation, trash pickup, those kinds of things deducted out of your pay. You'd go to the company store, maybe you didn't have enough money um, to buy groceries, you could put that on a credit line at the company store. Prices in the company store weren't too good, you know, they didn't have any competition to offer credit, so uh, this, the prices were pretty high. And what you could have, have happen is that the worker, by the time they got their paycheck at the end, end of the month, instead of getting paid, they would owe them money. They would owe the company money, because the company had deducted so many things from their paycheck. So um, I asked my grandmother if she ever joined a union or thought about organizing to try and get better uh, prices at the company store, better working conditions, and she said, oh, no, 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 we would never um, want to strike. And suddenly it dawned on me why that is, and that's because if you struck and lost your job, you weren't just going to lose your job, you were going to lose your church and your kids' school and your friends and um, your doctor and... The company just had so much control over you that you really couldn't take the chance of alienating yourself from the company. And um, also, the company had a lot of interest in seeing my dad's brothers come work for the company and not necessarily get a higher education. You know, at ninth grade or so, they really wanted the, the kids to stay and work for the company, and, and my dad and his brothers might have wanted to go to the high school, but the high school, there's a lot of class distinctions there between the, the kids at the high school who were the owner's kids who had um, nicer clothes and nicer transportation and those kinds of things versus the kids who lived in the company town who uh, didn't have those nice things and they might get made fun of at school and those kinds of things. And so 
um, very quickly this this company town came to see seemed like less and less of a good deal to my dad whereas to his parents it had seemed like um, uh, an answered prayer I guess so hopefully this has helped you understand how um, company town living could have its its pros and its cons all right I think we're gonna stop there because um, I see I'm around in about 15 minutes and maybe we'll break this lecture up into two and um, so I'll catch you with the second part um, next time okay thanks bye